My name is Sophia Colette Eric, and I'm an art historian, academic researcher, and curator of multisensory experiences. Right now, my main work is with the European funded project Odoropa, which advocates for smells and smelling as important to Europe's cultural heritage. It is my pleasure to welcome you as the host of the Internet of Senses podcast for the sense of smell. And today I have Hesut Sultano with me, who has received his bachelor's degree in electronic engineering and his PhD from Kumpultens University of Madrid in Spain. He has worked in instrumentation systems at the electronics department of Computens University, in chemical sensors and electronic noses at the Sensor Laboratory for Superior Research and Investigation in Madrid, and in control, modeling, and simulation at the Naval Engineering School of Polytechnic University of Madrid. Currently, he works as a professor at the Industrial Engineering School of the University of Extremadura in Spain. And as of 2019, he's the president of the Digital Olfaction Society, whose goal is to create devices that not only record smells, but also turn them into digital data and transmit and apply digital olfaction methodologies where useful. His research interests include machine learning and pattern recognition techniques, instrumentation of measurement systems, chemical sensors, and electronic noses. And it is my pleasure to welcome Jesus today uh, after that semi-long introduction. But we're really excited to have you and discuss your work today. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations for this podcast. I think it is very interesting to show the, the research uh, topics of different researchers to the society because it is the, one of the goals of the researchers, no? not only teaching and research, but also to transmit the knowledge to the, to the society. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you for saying that. And we're really excited to also have you on the podcast today. I think it's a, a new topic to discuss we ha- that we haven't discovered yet. So we'll start with talking about digital olfaction and we'll also talk about enoses and their purpose and use in, in society. So I wanted to start the podcast by letting our audience know to note that the topics that we'll discuss in the interview today may be more on the technical side, and it's first time for me discussing these topics. So we'll be kind of discovering this all together, and I may ask Jesus to repeat things or to explain things in a different way throughout the interview. So I hope that we both and all of you as listeners will be patient with us today. So to start, you have a background in engineering, electronics, and sensors, and I'm curious how this expertise led you to research in the field of olfaction, and can you explain your personal research journey for us? Yes, the relation between electronic instrumentation, gas, and chemical sensors, and olfaction is very clear because, as you know, the olfaction, or when we smell uh, something, is uh, related with a chemical part of the detection. So as you probably know, the the smells, the scents are produced by a number of chemical compounds that are in the ambient, or perhaps they are emitted by different substances. And we detect these scents or these smells by an interaction between these chemical compounds and the olfactory receptors that we are in, inside our nose. No? So what we do when we smell something is first an interaction between these chemical compounds that are responsible for odors, aromas, scents, etc., with these olfactory receptors, and they send a signal, an electrical signal to our brain. And after that, we store this, this signal in our brain and we put a label for this stimulus. No? So we, we smell, for example, a wine or a rose. We learn and we say, this is a rose, for example. No? So when we receive this stimulus again in, in, in a similar way, we identify it in our brain as a remember. So we can say or we can affirm uh, this is a rose. We are smelling a rose. No, so this part, this this procedure, we try to repeat in an electronic way, as uh, similar as we do, for example, in in other 
imitation of biological senses, like, for example, image or sound, no? we, we try to digitalize this stimulus and we do that with uh, electronic components. No? For example, in, in the case of computer vision, we use a camera. A camera is like a sensor that detects some colors, some uh, shapes, and, and turn, turn this stimulus into a digital data. No? The, the same occurs, for example, in the hearing. When we hear something, a, a sound, we can use a microphone and we can transform the air pressure into the microphone and electrical signal. So we try to do the same, but not in a physical way, like for example, an image in which the different colors are different wavelengths depending on the color or the frequency of the sound of the wave of the sound that are the different sounds or the different voices, etc. So in this case, it is a chemical uh, sense. The biological sense of smell and the tongue are chemical senses. So we uh, transform a chemical property in the case of smell are different chemical compounds. And in the case of the tongue, we, for example, uh, transform the, the acid, the salt, the sweet flavors into signals, no? So in our case, the world or, or the topic of machine olfaction is very related or very close to the uh, sensors or the chemical sensor discipline because uh, the first device or the first component, electronic component that we need for making or for developing an electronic nose or, or an artificial factory system is a component that uh, transforms a concentration of different uh, chemical compounds into a signal or several signals in the same way that we do in our biological nose. So the first part is the detection. So we detect uh, chemical compounds, we detect uh, a mixture of gases that are responsible of uh, an odor, of the, the, the emitter odor of uh, a food, a beverage, uh, etc. In this first part, we obtain a, a, an electrical signal. What we do with this uh, electrical signal is more or less the same that we do in our biological nose. So we send this electrical signal to like an artificial uh, brain that, uh, as you probably imagine, it will be uh, an artificial intelligence algorithm or machine learning uh, algorithm or program. Sorry, and do you give the machine like a prompt for for such a case or like how what is the job of the machine then in this case? The machine learning part. Yeah, we usually program. Uh, it's not a prompt like like a Chat GPT or, or different mm -hmm. algorithms or platforms. We try to integrate this machine learning part in the same prototype. So we have developed, for example, a program that have two parts. The first is the learning part. So imagine that we have an electronic nose, and the first part that I have explained before we obtain a signals or several signals from several sensors. And in the learning part, we do exactly the same in the biological nose. So this uh, group of signals correspond to another, okay? And another group of signals are clustered in another other. So we do it usually offline. So we do a lot of measurements and we uh, create a database with inputs and outputs. Okay, the inputs are the signals of the sensors and the outputs are the different labels that do we put to the different others. So imagine that we want to recognize, for example, different beverages, no? So we analyze our electronic nose. We, we could analyze, for example, a beer, wine, or different liquors, and we do all the measurements and we put a, a label on each sample that we analyze. We train the neural network or the artificial intelligence with these pairs of inputs and outputs. And after that, the system is ready to recognize new others. So if we, for example, analyze a new uh, sample, automatically it will classify in one of the classes that the system has previously learned. 
So it is uh, more or less in the same way that the biological nose works. And since we jumped ahead a little bit, can you explain what digital olfaction is and what an e-nose is? Are they the same? Is an e-nose part of digital olfaction? Can you explain the difference between these two things? Yeah, more or less the objective and the, the purpose is more or less the same, no? is to digitalize the human sense of smell. And the, the other part is to develop an electronic device that tries to mimic the biological nose. So they are more or less the same. An electronic nose could be a device and the uh, digital olfaction could be the discipline or the part of the engineering that tries to develop this type of devices, but they are very related definitions of more or less the same. Uh, as you probably know, the, the electronic instrumentation is digital in most cases. There are a few cases that we use analogic components, not uh, digital, but uh, since we use uh, computers, we use uh, microcontrollers or microprocessors, we always use uh, digital information. And why is it important to have digital olfaction or have e-noses? Why, why is this an important step in the digital world? I think that the, the main importance of this should be with the need of automation different uh, tasks. No, uh, For example, there is a lot of process in the food industry that the discrimination between, for example, different levels of quality is made with sensory panel. For example, the, the olive oil industry, the level of quality of the olive oil is performed by a sensory panel. Uh, the sensory panel is a group of perhaps 15, 20 tasters that smells the olive oil and determine the quality of it. You can imagine the, the problems that are in this in this case, no? Because the uh, as you know, the biological sense of the smell is uh, very subjective. So it depends on the sense of humor of the tasters. It also depends on if the, the testers are tired, if not. So it is difficult. And in this industry, there is a need for automation this process in order to have a device or, or a component that could be integrated in the in this process and try to do it in a more automatic way. No? As you can imagine, the training of a sensory panel is an, a very expensive task. You have to train 15, 20 people. Uh, they must be available for this task. So they are, in most cases, very repetitive tasks. You have to smell, uh, check if you have a defect, if there is a defect, you, you can sign in. If not, you have high quality oil, oil uh, and so on. And there is a, an example that with other, for example, uh, human senses, like uh, that has been mimicked with success in an artificial way, for example, computer vision. You, know, you can now, uh, in, in the industry, there is a lot of processes that has been monitorized by cameras so you can see in a lot of process, cameras that are uh, testing the devices and check if the, the bottle is okay or not, if the cup is okay or not, and so on. The same for the ear, no? And, and it has been a process in the last 20, 30 years in which, for example, uh, 20 years ago, we cannot imagine that our smartphone, we could scan, for example, the, the labels of different products or even the device that our smartphone that can detect our face and, okay, you can sign with your face or in the case of the human here, you can talk to our phone and say, hello, call to my mother, no? So mm -hmm. this process has been done with success in other senses, with the tactile systems also, and the sense of smell has been considered as a minor uh, sense. The most important are the, the sight and the ear. Perhaps it could be the third or fourth in importance. So we try to do the same than the other senses, but in this case with a chemical sense, that could be the, the olfaction. Yeah, this was exactly what I was going to ask you to do, is to compare it to things that we know that are already analyzed via digital. So this is a perfect example. 
in terms of quality assurance or quality checks that visually a machine could analyze, okay, the label is on correctly or a bottle is open or closed. And so mm -hmm. in, in your case, what you're saying is that digital olfaction can really help us or can be a tool for, for quality and for analyzing whether something is good or bad in terms of smell. So um, I wanted you to explain some of the research that you've done using the e-noses and the sorts of things that you've applied their okay. use to. Okay, the, the main applications are related with the process or that uh, use the human sense of smell as a, an instrument of analysis, no? So the first or, or the main field that use the human nose as a, an instrument of analysis is the food industry. You, know? you have a lot of industries that produce different uh, food products in the different parts of the elaboration process or uh, storage or so on. Use some tasters that analyze the products. For example, imagine wine, beer, different foods, meat, uh, fish in which the sensory panel or even the, the enologist or the, the people from the, the laboratories of uh, quality uh, analyze, uh, test the product and check if everything is, is right or not. So in this field, for example, we have worked in, I did my PhD in, in wine industry. As you know, the, the sensory panel is the, in the wine industry is very important because can check if there are defects in, in wine, for example, oxidation or perhaps some microorganism that generates fails or defects in the wine. So we, during my PhD, we developed some electronic noses uh, with different types of sensors, with different uh, sampling methods. And uh, we, we do different tests uh, related with, for example, the varieties of uh, grapes that are used for the wine. We also try to discriminate the aging methods of wine. It is different if you age the wine in, in French or in American oak barrels. If we have uh, some defects or uh, tries to detect or to predict the responses of a sensory panel, the descriptors of the wine, when you smell a wine, you say, it smells to this, this, and this, no? So these responses of the sensory panel, we, we have predicted by using an electronic nose. We have developed also devices for installing the in directly in the tanks of a wine cellar. So it is not necessary for the analogies to take a sample and to analyze because uh, with this system, we can monitor the state of the wine directly uh, from the tanks uh, and in, in a continuous way. So we can alert to the analogies if we detect something that could be wrong in this process. So in this field, we, we have uh, done a lot of measurement and a lot of experiments. I wanted to ask a brief question. So you just mentioned that you're able to use the digital nose or the e-nose to let the ethnologist know if it detected something. Is it also the other way around that you use these experts and their methodologies for sensory panels, for example, to then inform the enos because they have sensory panel methodologies and what their outcomes what kind of outcomes they want so do you use those to inform the enos as as to what it will be doing yes uh, well in fact we have used the the responses of the sensory panel to train the electronic nose to give some responses so you can imagine an electronic nose like a, for example a, a, a police dog in which the trainers teach the dogs to detect uh, drugs, for example, a, a person that has been in a place or a lost person and so on. So they train you know, and they, they give an, a positive answer. They give a price. And if not, uh, you, you try to, to give a feedback to the dog. In this case, it's more or less the, the similar, very similar. You, you can have uh, pairs of inputs, outputs, and the output could change. So you can change how to train the, the electronic nose by the answers, for example, of a sensory panel. So you can train, uh, for example, to say if the wine has a defect or not, or you can train the e-nose for 
giving a punctuation between zero and 100 to give a quality index, for example, or you, you can train to detect if the wine is from one variety or another one, if you have frauds in the wine. So you can train uh, depending on the outputs that you give to the to the e-notes. And have you also used the e-notes for medical evaluations or like you're saying with the dogs, I know do there are also cadaver dogs, for example, or drug dogs. Have you worked with this in your research as well? Yes, we have worked with a lot of people. We have been working in this field for more than 20 years. So we have been working, for example, with the police in order to detect different drugs, explosives, and chemical compounds that could injure the, the, the policeman because they have a problem with the dogs, that the, the dogs uh, could be tired if they are smelling for a long time. In some cases, it is dangerous for the dogs. So imagine that you have drugs in, in a car, and if the dogs enter in, in the car and smell the, the drugs, they could even die. So they need perhaps another device that could be more robust to this type of dangerous a situation you know also it is very difficult with some explosives that in some cases doesn't smell for example plastic explosives uh, are not doesn't emit a lot of volatile compounds that could be detected by dogs and we have been working with the police in this aspect we have a, a student that did phd in detecting different diseases to the human breath because we emit in, in the breath different organic compounds that are biomarkers of different uh, diseases. So if we could develop a device for detecting these diseases, it could be uh, very good for them. No? There are devices that could be find, found in, the, in hospital, but uh, what we try to develop is like a personal device. Imagine that I have a disease, for example, asthma, and for different reasons, I could have an increase in my illness. So I have to go to the hospital. I have to go to the fair to do a test, then to go to the doctor. He sees the analysis and it has a very high cost. And if I had, for example, a portable device in my house, I could blow into this device and this device could analyze my breath and send directly to the doctor and the doctor could see the concentration of the compounds and gives uh, like not in real time, but very, very few a response. And for example, I have to, to take a pill and, or so on. So this, has, this is another interesting application for this type of devices. Okay. I definitely want to go back to that point, but first I want to ask, what does working with the police look like in terms of training the e nose as a dog would assist a police officer yes the 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 main advantages of working with the police is that we have access to real samples for example we we had a project with uh, for the de detection of explosives and so on and we couldn't use explosives for security reasons no and we use simulates chemical compounds that are the structure are very similar to the explosives, but not real one. But in this collaboration with the police, we can have access. We go to the laboratories of the, the police and we could use the, the compounds that, that are explosive, not simulants. So this collaboration was very useful for, for that, for, for us. And even the police give us an, an award in that uh, field of research. And we uh, did some experiments giving the, the police some advantages of using this type of devices that could be, for example, the, the low cost of the devices. A dog has a higher cost in training and in, in maintenance, etc. And our devices are very low cost device. So and other advantages is in terms of uh, mobility. You know, we could combine these devices in mobile robots or even in drones, so we can fly a drone to a place where it has no good access for police and even for dogs, and try to analyze what is in that place. And are there places where these e-noses are already in use? Is it common 
to use the Enos with the police, for example? Is it an international thing or is this kind of sacred in, in your area of the world or in er your area of research? I'm sure it's not, but just to, to ask. We have done some tests in laboratory condition or in real control situations, no? So now the point in which we are is to contact, uh, we have contacts with some companies that are developing or, or adapting these type of devices to the market and they could be commercialized, etc. So we, we as a university, as a research center, we have our limitations in, we, we develop prototypes, not devices for the market. So we are in that point and now our, the companies are the, the responsible for doing it more near to the market. Yeah, I, I understand that completely because we have the same thing with Odoropa where yeah. these things that we're researching are so interesting for the regular society, you could say, but then because we're a research project, we have our certain outcomes, but also like the tools serve a certain purpose or can be used in a certain way. And so I completely understand that then your research can't necessarily be commercialized, right? So you have to find, or I guess somehow it has to make it out into the commercial world because it seems like a really interesting topic. Yeah, yeah but it is just the same that, for example, the computer vision, it is started or the, or the autonomous vehicles, no? That all they started in a research project and after that, the knowledge is transferred to one or several companies that do it better and, and, and try to solve the, the problems in the real world, try to compensate, say, these effects and to, to bring these devices to the market. So it is a normal uh, procedure. But I think for the, for the use in the medical industry or the medical field, it would be really, really interesting and really rewarding to have a device that could tell you what disease you have or be able to communicate that so easily, like what you were saying earlier. I, I hope that it comes out at some point. I think there's also an ENOS for this purpose in Amsterdam at the Frey University. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of it before. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, um... but it is uh, just the same. For example, some weeks ago, I, I bought a new smartphone and you have to fill the data because the, the smartphone with the with the smartwatch uh, can monitor your heart rate. So if you have a problem, the mobile phone uh, automatically calls or send a message to your mother, your contact person, and sends the location and send the, the problem that the smartphone is detecting. So perhaps in a near future, the device also could detect when you are talking with your phone, it can detect a biomarker and, and perhaps give an alert to, to the doctor or to a familiar or, or something like that. Yeah. And do you think that these sorts of digital measuring devices can replace humans or replace dogs, for example, with no. uh, police? No. No, <laughs> no in, the, in the same way that in other aspects, no, you cannot replace the sense of vision, no, you, the digital assistants are good for repetitive actions or to monitor, but it is impossible to replace. And in this case, in the, in the case of olfaction, we have to take into account that, for example, a dog has in that there are 200 million olfactory cells and we have uh, 20 million and the electronic nodes that we are developing right now have 20, 30 sensors. So it, they, they are good for detecting very specific things, but not as a universal device that could detect explosive food, the biomarkers. So they are good for very specific tasks. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you said that because it's nice to know that humans and dogs are still useful. <laughs> no. <laughs> I would like to know about being the president of the Digital Olfaction Society. What, what is the Digital Olfaction Society and why did you start it? The Digital Olfaction Society is a society that tries to diffuse the main advantages or and the main advances that the technology has 
in this particular field. So this society has been founded by Marvin Edeas. He's a, a doctor at the at the hospital in in Paris, and he founded this society. This society has done a lot of congresses and meetings for communication between the different parts that are in this field, like the industry, researchers, not only from the part of electronic notes and digital olfaction, but also psychologists, uh, doctors, perfumists, uh, people from the industry. So we put uh, in contact in order to advance in this field. This society has organized uh, from 2011 till the last year uh, annual meetings to do that. And in 2008, uh, Marvin tell me if I want to, to do the, the president of this society because of my research works in, the, in this field. And I accepted because uh, it is a very exciting discipline and it is it perfectly fits with my research topics. So I, I accepted and we continue doing these workshops and, and congresses. We have also a web page, channel in YouTube, in which we, we try to, to publish the different advances in this field. What is the role of the perfumers and the psychologists in the Digital Faction Society? Do they advise? Do they add to it? What, what is their role? The advances of the technology not only comes from the part of sensors or the part of artificial intelligence. For example, imagine that you have in the field of vision, it is very easy to describe a color, no? So you take an instrument, you take the, the wavelength of the light that reflects, and if the wavelength is 400, it means that you have a red color, okay? Or even you have a chart of different colors, you go to a painter, no? So you have a chart of colors and you say, I, I like this color, okay? But in the field of scents, and the smells, you smell something and it is very difficult to express with words, no? You say, it is like, uh, they, they don't have a name. They have the, a name of the objects that smells like this, no? So you smell something and you say, it smells like an orange, no? But you, you cannot describe the, the smell. So the name is associated to a product that smells like, like it, no? But with the color is totally different. So you say this is white and this is gray, and, and you in some cases you have orange color, for example, is like an orange. Okay. But you have yellow color and no lemon color. Okay. So it is important work in how to describe the, the different scents, the different odors, to establish different categories. Of course, it is very difficult to generate scents and smells. Because, like in the case of the colors, if you mix red and uh, yellow, you obtain the orange color. But if you you cannot mix two odors or two scents and obtain a new one, so you have a mixture. When you want to generate odors, it is very difficult to to combine because the chemical of odors is very complicated. You can mix two compounds and obtain a new one that are not related with those that you have mixed. And in some cases, for example, you have chemical compounds that are very similar and they smell very different one from another. So the chemical of others is also very complicated. So that is the reason why not only electronic engineers or uh, computer science engineers are, are needed for this purpose. No? We need chemics. The sense of smell is the, the less understood of all the senses. The Nobel Prize in, in, in 91 was given to two researchers that uh, discover a lot of the human sense of smell, but there is a lot of unknown in this, in this field. Is it difficult because that's interdisciplinary? So you're bringing a lot of different types of minds together. So is it a challenge to get everybody to speak the same language or does everybody sort of understand each other? The different fields speaks different languages, but uh, we have points in, in common. So it is not difficult to, to understand uh, from one to another because we have several points in which we can consider this and we can extrapolate the knowledge from one field to, a, to another. 
So that is the reason why the Congresses in this field tries to combine people from different disciplines and, for example, to organize different uh, parts or, or in the Congress dedicated to different parts of the field. And I learn from the chemists, the chemists learn from the psychologists and so on. So it is good to have this mixture. And are you welcoming new members into your society? And if so, how do people join Digital Olfaction Society? I recommend to visit the, the webpage, digitalolfaction.com. And in, in next spring, we will celebrate our annual meeting. So I invite all the people to, to come to, to our meeting and to uh, give a talk or to expound different or new topics and new applications that could be afforded with this type of devices. Or we can also learn, to, we can, people could uh, tell us their experiments and we could learn from these new experiments and whatever, similar in like other disciplines. No? So you teach in the university and you yeah. also are the president of the Digital Faction Society. Are there any other projects that you're working on right now? Yes, we have a project in which we are trying to develop very, very small miniaturized electronic noses. For example, we are developing a, a smartwatch with gas sensor that could help, for example, people that has lost the sense of smell during the COVID-19 pandemic. So they are very lost no? because they don't know what are the smells. If they are eating food that are in good or bad uh, state, they have to take a shower because uh, they don't can they cannot smell themselves. So we are in contact with some doctors in Germany to produce a smartwatch to help these people to to have a, a better life, no? Because they are concerned about the, the environment. Because you could think that the, ah, the the sense of smell is not important, but when you lose it, you know that what important is it. Yeah, and a, a nosmia or any yeah, yeah. sort of anosmia is quite a challenge to go through. So that's that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's the status on such a device? Is it successful so far or are you having some challenges with it? We have developed the first version of this watch in order to detect at the beginning the, the CO2 concentration because it is important to open the windows with uh, a lot of people and, or for example, to detect the air quality, okay? And we can also inform the user about the whole quantity of scents. So we have an indicator in parts per million of the, the quantity of smells. So we, we now are working in trying to detect uh, certain aromas that could, for example, or others that are dangerous for example if you have food in not very good state mm. or if you have a gas leakage or, and so on we, we try to focus not uh, be so general but to focus in in this application very interesting are there any other projects you want to share we are trying also to develop uh, novel gas sensors because the problem of some sensors are not very specific of different compounds so we, we have uh, opened a new research line in our laboratory. So we are going to detect or to develop different uh, or novel gas sensor based on optical and resistive uh, properties of different uh, nanomaterials in order to try to generate a better uh, gas sensors. Because as I have said before, the number of sensors is very reduced. So perhaps with uh, some specific materials, we could create an array of gas sensors with a higher number of sensors. Try to mimic also the, the biological sense of smell. So are the gas sensors that you're referring to, is that about environmental chemicals that are in the air or did I misunderstand you there? Yes, we optimize the, the material and the composition of the sensor for detecting different compounds. So we try to combine different materials in order to detect the higher number of compounds possible. Okay, so we will now conclude the podcast with one final question. And it, it's a big question. So how will digital olfaction and the use of e-noses change our future? 
I think we kind of touched upon this throughout the interview, but definitely to pinpoint it is a nice ending. Perhaps these type of devices could help people no, to enhance the, the detection by using personal devices. No? And on the other hand, to detect, for example, compounds that we are not able to detect. It's like giving us a new sense, no? That we don't, we don't uh, able, for example, to detect magnetism. And imagine that, uh, for example, in our smartphone we have a detector of the north and south, no? So in this way, this type of devices could help us in these two two ways, uh, giving us the opportunity to detect compounds that we cannot detect. We cannot detect the CO, for example, because it doesn't smell, but uh, with these devices, we can do it or detect compounds in lower concentration that we, we can detect. Okay. And I'm sure that in the case of computer vision, perhaps the next generation of smartphones could include a small number of gas sensors. So it will be uh, good for developers of software to do uh, applications that could use this information for a lot of different applications in the same way than uh, when the smartphones had a camera. No? The main increase in the use of computer vision algorithms is when we all of us has a, a camera in our smartphones. No? So perhaps in a near future, if the smartphone has gas sensor, the number of applications of digital function could increase a lot and it will done that the sensors will improve. So it's like a circle to, yeah. of improvements in this, in this field. Yeah, well, I've, I've learned a lot from you today. I think the topic is really interesting and I don't have much knowledge about it or I didn't have much knowledge about it. So to learn that digital olfaction or e-noses could help with safety, for example, standing in the place of a police officer or a dog and making situation or finding out situations or investigations without the use of or putting humans or animals in, in danger. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting. And then you also talked about quality check. So being able to use an e-nose to check the quality of our food or also like stand in the form of an ethnologist. So to be able to not have to do a sensory panel, but to be able to use an e-nose in place yeah. of that. And then I think one of the most interesting components that we talked about today was in terms of health and medicine. So being able to have a device that could tell you if you might have a certain disease or detect it faster than going through yeah. a lots of tests or to go to the doctor. I mean, of course you would then go to the doctor, but to have this kind of early diagnosis is really interesting. And I think also would be a huge step in terms of insurance and faster healthcare. So I really hope to see something like this happen broadly in the near future. And it seems like people like you are making it happen faster. So I'm very happy about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So thank you for joining me today. And I will definitely follow your research or continue to follow your research. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this talk and congratulations for the idea of this podcast.